Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the scoping meeting for the Town Center Specific Plan EIR. Um, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to hear your input regarding the potential impacts that uh, should be considered in the upcoming environmental impact report. There already seems to be a good deal of consensus that the town center specific plan holds great potential for the community with its aims to create a vibrant and inclusive mixed use hub for community engagement, retail, restaurants, entertainment and new residential living opportunities. Um, with that said though, um, we recognize that any project of this scale will have potential uh, impacts, both positive and potentially negative. And that's why we're here tonight. Um, we, we're here to ensure that the future growth of Diamond Bar is approached responsibly with careful consideration to the potential impacts um, on our environment and the community itself. Your input is valuable to this process. We want to hear your concerns and co suggestions regarding the content of the EIR because your comments will help us shape its scope and ensure that all potential impacts are thoroughly analyzed and mitigated to the best extent possible. We're here to work together to create a comprehensive and well-informed EIR for the Town Center specific plan. And don't worry if you prefer not to speak tonight or if something comes to mind later because you will have until July 5th to submit written comments to us and still have those acknowledged in the upcoming uh, environmental document. Our team of environmental experts uh, will take note of your comments and concerns and will consider them in the development of the uh, draft EIR, which will be made available for public review and comment in the future. Uh, that process ensures um, transparency and accountability uh, throughout this process. I um, will now uh, turn the meeting over to Neil Payton of Torty Gallus and Partners, who will summarize the, the project description. Um, he'll go over uh, a lot of details that uh, some of you have already heard once or twice or seven or eight times. Um, but uh, I see some new faces here tonight. So I think it's important to uh, just walk through um, the highlights of the proposed plan. And then uh, we'll turn the meeting over to Laura Mel of Sapphos Environmental, who will explain the meeting format and the process for taking note of your comments. So um, with that, once again, thank you for joining us tonight. Good evening, everyone. I want to just uh, introduce first our team who's here. Uh, and uh, let me start with the Torty Gallus folks. I'm Neil Payton, as Greg said, I've been leading this process to this point. With me uh, tonight is, and from our team, is Bettina Sassan, uh, who you might have met previously in some of the workshops. And we have a summer intern, Sunny Chow, who's standing next to her. And she's participating. She's uh, going into her fourth year at USC. Uh, and then um, from Gibson Transportation is uh, Jonathan Chambers. And Jonathan has been uh, uh, part of this effort the entire time. Uh, and some of his efforts are uh, seen on the what we're trying to do on Diamond Bar Boulevard, but that's not all of his efforts. And then of course we're here, the, the really the star of the show this evening is Sapphos Environmental, because they're the ones guiding this process through the environmental, uh, through CEQA, 
which is the unique to California process of looking at all of the potential impacts that uh, are relevant in this case. Uh, Laura is uh, right here and will be speaking after me. She's joined by Marie Campbell, the CEO of President or CEO or, you know, head person um, at, at, at Safos. And then uh, Rory uh, Baker, Rory Baker is uh, standing in the back uh, as well with a red sweater. So I think that's, that's everyone that's here. Let me uh, start. I'm going to take you through uh, the process or the project again. If you've been here once, twice or seven times, you've seen all of these slides. You ha there's not a new one. But if you've never been here, they'll all be new. And so we're, we're here for showing some of these for that purpose. Again, here's the site at Diamond Bar Boulevard, uh, right here. So an interesting mouth, hard to control. And Golden Springs Drive. And here's the Pomona Freeway here. Uh, and it's about 45 acres. And I always like to emphasize, this is one half of 1% of Diamond Bar's land area. We uh, wanted to highlight the list of goals that we uh, have established, both through your feedback, the staff's feedback, and sort of fusing it with the general plan because we're here, because the general plan itself asks for a town center uh, in this spot. So that's number one, uh, the number one goal. Implement that, uh, the general plan, fostering the development of a vibrant pedestrian oriented town center, a place to shop, dine and gather. That is directly quoted from the general plan. Uh, we wanna make the town center a complete neighborhood with a sense of place. And we say complete, meaning that most of the things you would need in daily life to be here. We want to make sure that the physical design and the programming, meaning the stuff that's there, support health and well being. We want to provide for a car light or car optional living. It doesn't mean no cars, it means you can be here without a car. That's different than no car. Uh, great public spaces, parks, and what we're calling regenerative landscapes, meaning we're going to make the earth better by doing this. Accommodating a range of housing densities and types and levels of affordability. So as to implement the sixth cycle housing element and to fulfill the city's commitment to, purport, to provide for affordable housing. This is really the implementation of uh, what's called RENA or the Regional Housing Needs Assessment Allocation. There's really two A's there. But, uh, um, providing for flexibility for the future, particularly for retail and commercial space. Many folks ask, is there going to be this or is there going to be that? And it is impossible to give you that answer at this moment, because we don't know when some of these things will actually develop. This could be a 20 year build out. We don't know what stores will exist then. We don't know what the market will be then. And so when you make a plan like this, you have to provide flexibility so that it, it can accommodate a range of things, some of which we might not even know exist right now um, as, a, as a use. Um, and again, particularly very important in this case that to be developable in phases, partly because we have 23 separate landowners and you know, some of them, in order for some of those sites to develop, they will have to get together with others because the sites are kind of small. Um, so when that happens, when those assemblages occur, who knows? Now, the, the original um, general plan called for something like 900 units. And then when the housing element was adopted, it had to be up to 1,350 units. And this was to accommodate the uh, city's housing allocation, um, housing needs, housing allocation um, commitment. And as we began this process, we had RCL Co, who's one of the premier market assessment firms in the United States, do a study of the area. Uh, they came up with a, 
essentially a need for somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 2,055 units or a market for 2,055 units. And so what you'll see tonight is actually three scenarios, but the one that we're promoting is the one with 2,055 because that's what we think the market is. We have a low end of 1,355, which meets the housing needs allowance and a middle kind of end because you need a middle. Um, so uh, that's, that's the, the number of housing units. Uh, why does it have to be that many? Why are we allocating for the top number, you might wonder? Because we believe that in order to get the owners of the parcels in the property interested, we have to give them enough of a carrot uh, in order to make it worthwhile to develop. Otherwise, you get nothing and then you don't get your town center. So we also think you need a certain amount of housing density on the site in order to make viable some of the retail uses that folks would like to see here. The kind of thing that somebody who lives here might actually uh, go to on a pretty regular basis. So as you have heard me talk a lot, the, the plan really focuses on creating connections, literally physical connections across the site, through the site, and that's what you see in this sort of basic diagram. That led to a kind of a public space diagram that you see here with neighborhood streets and retail streets and public places. In this case, a, a central plaza that was really at the heart uh, of the site. And here you see that uh, again. This diagram really shows the mix of uses on the ground floor. The buildings are taller than one story, but on the ground floor, the buildings that are striped are buildings that have retail on the ground floor and housing above. The buildings that are yellow are, are all housing. The buildings that are solid red are only retail. The building that's blue is some sort of public or civic use. And the building that's purple, buildings that's purple, are hotels or uh, lodging of some sort, boutique hotel, etc. Uh, so that's that's that plan, and then here's simply a, a roof plan of the whole of the whole site, and an aerial view. And you can see in this aerial view, we've got an area of townhouses, and then we've got areas of four, five, and even six-story buildings in some cases. You might wonder, geez, I look at that plan. Where where did it park? I mean, yes, actually, there's quite a lot of parking. Uh, because basically many of these the buildings are designed as either podiums and i'll explain this or what's sometimes referred to as wraps a podium is where there's literally several floors of parking and the housing sits above that and you see that here and then usually along the street edge there's something covering up the parking so you can't see it from the street because no one likes to walk by a parking garage so that's a podium in the wrap which you see illustrated here, you have basically a garage in the middle and units off of a corridor facing on the perimeter. And you might say, wait a minute, nobody wants to look into a garage. Well, nobody does look into a garage because the corridor is up against the garage. And just like in any apartment building or hotel you've been in where there's a corridor, there are units on one side, but in this case, there are no units on the other, it's the garage. When you're in this space, you won't know there's a garage there. Uh, so, and that's what you see illustrated here. The units, the corridor, and the garage. So that's where the parking is, both for the housing as well as for the retail. And there's quite a lot of it. One of the things that we, always, that we try to accomplish here is as much as possible making this a pedestrian friendly environment and one of the ways we did that was to minimize overly uh, parking on the surface because what we have found it was that when parking exceeds about 10 percent of the land area on the surface it becomes less and less pedestrian friendly because pedestrians really don't like to walk by parking lots so at the moment we have about i think as a 45 percent surface coverage of parking 
and this would bring it down to 5.4% over time, obviously. Likewise, what we've tried to do is create a tremendous amount of intersections, what we call intersection density, which is the number of intersections per square mile. You might wonder why we'd want to do that. It turns out that pedestrian-friendly environments actually have a lot of intersections. The reasons for this are several fold. One, more streets allow more routes to any destination by cars. That means no one route has to take all of the traffic. So when you spread the traffic out onto multiple streets, each one takes only a smaller portion. That makes it easier to cross. It's safer as a pedestrian. It is actually safer as a driver as well, as a lot of statistics garnered from throughout California have shown. The second reason it's better for pedestrians is because there's more places to cross the streets. It is, despite the fact that you can do mid-block crossings with lights and all that, and they do, they do help, it is not as good as an intersection to cross at. And so the more intersections you have, the more places there are for pedestrians to cross the street. And that is fundamentally important in any retail-oriented environment, but it's really important for any pedestrian-oriented environment. So we have gone from something like, I think it was like 50 or 60 intersections per square mile, which is not considered a pedestrian-friendly environment, to 284 per square mile, which is. These are the, the low, medium, and high uh, plans. And I, you might say, gee, they look awfully similar. They kind of are. Uh, the difference being number of stories and also the number of sites we assumed would redevelop. So in the lowest one, we assume uh, the most sites that aren't being redeveloped. And you can sort of see those because they're well, actually, I'm going to use this thing. Like here, this is the McDonald's and the some other bits. Um, gas station, another gas station. And then as you get to this one, which let's face it, is a long time in the future, everything redevelops. So, you know, that's the range. But the strategy remains the same throughout all of the, all three of the of the plans and then um you know one of the things we noted is of course there's a a rather significant grade change on the southern part of the site closer to golden springs which does afford the opportunity if designed correctly to have a wonderful view of the san gabriel mountains and so assuming that it all redevelops here's a view down a new staircase with accessible ramp uh, and a view out <clears throat> to the mountains, which could be the kind of main street of downtown Diamond Bar. And then this, the, the square that I mentioned earlier in front of a public building of some sort. At one point we were talking about it as a civic building, a new city hall or something, but maybe not that. Maybe it's a museum, maybe it's a dance or performance center, maybe it's any combination thereof, a new library, could be anything. It's a site that's available for that. And a view from Diamond Bar Boulevard into that space. And then the, one of the other important considerations is Diamond Bar Boulevard itself. It is a very big street blasting through this downtown, this new downtown. Honestly, it's not going to make a great downtown. It's going to make two parts, but top street to cross. And you know, at the very first community meeting we had, we had a number of wild ideas thrown out. Among them was something called a road diet. And a road diet, sort of like any diet. Well, not really. Easy. In this case, it's like liposuction for a road because you're you're literally just cutting off some of the lane. So um, here, here it is today. And um, we, Jonathan, actually, where is Jonathan? He's sitting down. He recognized that um, 
Yes, it seems like there's a lot of traffic, but what you really have is, is, is sort of intersection problem, not so much a capacity problem on the roadway. So yes, uh, this intersection at Diamond Bar and Golden Springs has issues, and we're looking to fix that. But the rest of it maybe isn't, doesn't need six lanes and a left turn lane. And so the idea is potentially to two things. One is to reduce the lane width from 12 feet to 11, which is perfectly fine for a downtown street. Reduce the left turn lane from 16 feet, which it is now, to 10, which does reduce that center median. But let's face it, no one can use that center median. Let's give it back to where people can use it. But the second part of this is to actually get rid of the right turn, the right lane, I should say, part of the way down each block, allowing it to expand again to create a right turn into the sites, because that's where the traffic is being built up at that spot. If you're going to turn right, you'd be in this lane, but then you'd get into this lane. Sorry, I'm not so good on this cursor. As opposed to now, you might be coming down this road, not realize that this guy up here is going to turn right and be stuck behind them. So it, it should actually help. The other thing it does is it reduces the, the crossing distance by a third or a fourth, something like that, a lot, making it much easier to cross. So something like that could go to something like that and even create something like that. Now, um, <clears throat> this doesn't look like Diamond Bar Boulevard today, but this could be it. This is done, this is not unheard of. Um, it's a pretty bold idea, but cities are doing this across the United States because they're recognizing that pedestrians also have a place in the urban environment. In fact, a very important place. So there it is, 85, I'm sorry, 86 to 65 feet. And here's a, a cross section of that. With, by the way, a fully protected bike lane in each direction, as opposed to now a single stripe that forces the biker to straddle between the gutter pan and the asphalt. And it's pretty dangerous to me. I'm sure there is the occasional person using it, but. Okay, with that said, so as Greg, as Greg mentioned earlier, there are seven purposes of CPLOT towards uh, providing a clear, transparent process and planning. CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act in order to, uh, towards maintaining a high quality physical environment for the people of California, informing, informing both government decision makers and the public about the potential significant impacts of a project, preventing significant avoidable damage, evaluating both the proposed project that was evaluated in the initial study, as well as alternatives, uh, some alternatives over here and mitigation measures, disclosing to the public the reason that an approval was uh, made, and um, improving interagency coordination and public uh, participation is key to the process. So I'll provide an overview of the three-step CEQA process and then go through what the opportunities are for public participation before we collect public comment tonight at this building. So first, um, the three-step CEQA process, which is so shown on the right, we have to determine if the proposed action is a project, which means that it would cause a physical change in the environment, either directly or indirectly, and is either undertaken by a public agency, funded by a public agency, or involves issuance of entitlement. This is undertaken by a public agency. As mentioned earlier, the general plan does uh, include a town center focus area, and we are evaluating the uh, specific plan in more detail. So this is still a proposed project. The second stage, uh, step of CEQA uh, three-step process is whether the project is exempt. 
If it's ministerial, then um, for instance, a building permit, no condition use, um, then CEQA is, it, um, is not required. Uh, however, this is a discretionary project and it does not qualify for a statutory exemption or a categorical exemption. And the, the third step is determining what the appropriate environmental document is if it's not exempt. This project is not exempt from CEQA and we prepared an initial study that um, is supporting the scoping period right now that uh, came with, the initial study came to the conclusion that an EIR is necessary to evaluate uh, potential mitigation measures and alternatives. So, uh, stepping back again, uh, the general plan EIR was approved, as the environmental impact report was approved in 2019 and did consider the town center at a, another level of development than is proposed uh, in the initial study. Uh, the, a supplemental EIR is going to be prepared uh, based on the increased density and um, other details that Neil described earlier that are uh, in more detail than the town center. And we will be looking at alternatives and mitigation measures. And part of uh, tonight's meeting is to get community feedback on any ideas for issue areas to be evaluated, uh, alternatives, and um, and um, feasible mitigation that you'd like to propose. So the, in, here's a summary of the initial study. Uh, 11 out of 20, there's 20 environmental issue areas in CEQA. Uh, those issue areas were determined to have no impacts or less than significant impacts. Those are agriculture, biological resources, cultural resources, energy, geology, hazards, land use, mineral resources, population, tribal cultural resources, and wildfire. This is building upon the general plan EIR. So uh, the determination is based on, in the initial study, is based on whether there would be any new or substantially more adverse effects that need to be considered. So the initial study uh, found that there were no new impacts or more significant impacts for those issue areas. For nine of them, uh, the, the supplemental EIR will evaluate these nine environmental topics to determine the level of potential impact, uh, evaluate mitigation measures, and comparative uh, analysis if for alternatives. And this is for aesthetics, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, hydrology, noise, public services, recreation, transportation, and utilities. We have, we have just started the 30-day scoping period and we will be recording verbal comments tonight and you can provide written comments to the city, who's the lead agency, either through comment cards that are provided at the check-in table tonight or you can uh, provide an email uh, or a handwritten written letter to the city. The document is available online and at City Hall and Diamond Bar Library. This is the first of three opportunities for public participation during the CEQA process. We have the 30-day scoping period in which we, um, the city is collecting comments um, on the scope of the environmental analysis. And then after that period, there's a 45-day public review period for the draft supplemental EIR and there's an opportunity for public comments during that period. And after that public review period, a final EIR is prepared and a decision is rendered at a city council hearing because the, the city is the city council is the decision maker for the supplemental EIR. And there is an opportunity to provide public comment at the hearing. Uh, tonight, we have five stations. The community meeting, the scoping meeting is set up to collect comments one-on-one um, -on -one at each of these five stations uh, so that we have an opportunity for everyone to provide your, their voices. We have, we're going to have uh, people stationed each one to collect your comment and we'll be, uh, listen to your comment, write it, repeat it back to you, write it down uh, after we verified that it's consistent with what you intended to say. And uh, then if anybody has an agreement or disagrees with those comments, we can do a plus for agreement and a minus for um, disagreement right there. So there are five stations. This station right here is if you have any uh, comments to provide for scoping on the project, proposed project, the specific plan or alternatives, 
uh, and that's going to be uh, with Neil is going to be there collecting the comments. And we have a station for land use and population and housing. Marie will be there collecting comments um, if you have any uh, comments regarding that topic. Uh, I will be at the Aesthetics, Public Services and Recreation station over there. And then Rory will be leading the, um, the water, noise and utilities station in the back. In the very back, we have uh, transportation, air quality and greenhouse gas emissions comments. Jonathan will be there. If you have any comments that are not related to those topics, um, questions about the process, uh, we can write them down at any of the stations, but these are topics to, to help provide some, some guidance. So after we receive all these comments, we'll be compiling them and the environmental document will include, um, uh, will provide documentation of where each of the comments is being uh, addressed in the draft EIR. And then during the uh, public comment period for the draft EIR, uh, there will be additional time for comments and then those comments will be responded to in the final EIR. Uh, so thank you for your time and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. This has been helpful to come and see the drawings and hear the um, you know, professionals talk about the planning for potentials of changing Diamond Bar Boulevard, uh, you know, having more intersections, potentially having uh, more than a one or two story building, which is potential. And again, nothing's in concrete. And with 23 separate landowners, I can see this is going to be a very complex project. It's not going to be. Uh, happening overnight. It'll probably take 30 to 40 years before the whole thing uh, potentially gets built out. Uh, but I just, you know, want to be aware of what's going on in, in my community. And uh, that's, that's why I'm here. I've been uh, following the meeting along the way. So this is uh, uh, another progress, I believe. So that's why we come here to see the progress and hopefully get some insights as well. Yeah. We are looking for the most parties, the very uh, uh, friendly living uh, environment and that we don't need to drive too far distance and we can have everything um, close by. I'm most looking forward to the commercial aspect of the new development because I feel like Diamond Bar doesn't really have a lot of places to buy clothes or retail types of things. Um, mostly consumers in Diamond Bar go to other cities like Chino Hills and Umbrea to buy stuff that they want.